uh, people are popping in. So welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today for our webinar, for our discussion, online discussion and webinar about telehealth and looking beyond COVID. Today's presenters I'm going to introduce to you are, is Tom Foley, the Vice President of Growth here at AMD Global Telemedicine, and Rhett Stover, the Chief Executive Officer at Oklahoma State University. Just a few things to keep in mind as we're going through the webinar. We will be taking questions uh, at the end. So feel free to type in your questions along the way into the, in the bottom, uh, the Q&A session screen. And we'll go through as many as we can at the end. Also, the whole webinar will be recorded and everybody registered for the webinar today will receive a link to the recording by tomorrow morning for the webinar. I'm gonna hand it over to you, Tom. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. And thank you, Rhett, uh, for uh, for joining us in this uh, in this discussion. Uh, as Carrie said, my name is uh, Tom Foley. I'm the uh, the VP of Growth here at A and B Global Telemedicine, and looking forward uh, to speaking with uh, everyone today about uh, a looking beyond COVID. Uh, and with that, I will advance the slides. So uh, the COVID impact, uh, you know, COVID has done uh, the unfortunate thing about COVID uh, is obviously the, the impact uh, to uh, our residents uh, or, or uh, you know, the, the, the entire community. Uh, however, it has uh, taught us a, a lot of different things around uh, our delivery care uh, uh, infrastructure. And so I wanna take a look at, you know, what we were doing actually before COVID as well as what COVID taught us and how that, that advancement of COVID um, uh, really does accelerate the, the, uh, the, the reimagination of the delivery of care model. So the, the good news is that uh, you know, COVID, uh, before COVID, telehealth was really a nice to have uh, platform. Now it's almost a must have. And we have some very interesting statistics from both the consumer side of the equation and the physician side of the equation that says, yeah, this is good. I like this, and let's keep using it. Um, and uh, and you know, and the facilitator of that really has to do uh, with some a very quick uh, decision making uh, from our CMS uh, uh, partners. In that, you know, they really changed uh, the policies quickly to be able to adapt to the uh, to the challenges that our delivery of care. Uh, infrastructure was having relative to engaging uh, patients and the and the providers. So, you know, changing the uh, the or the originating site, uh, and making uh, telehealth um, a a billable event uh, where it might not have been so so broadly adopted in the past. Uh, but ultimately, th their their policy changes as well as the um, the adoption of telehealth is really change the way in which we, uh, we are looking at the delivery of care. Uh, with that, you know, so what are those impacts? So obviously with the onset of COVID, we, you know, nothing that you don't already know in that you know, it was difficult for providers and patients to uh, have, um, uh, have, a, uh, have an engagement. So doing that video only uh, type of uh, engagement was kind of a mandatory thing if, if in fact uh, patients were able, were going to be able to see um, see their providers, and why is that? Uh, and, and obviously, what COVID has taught us is, you know, coming into the uh, waiting room with a with a contagious condition, whether it be a cold, the flu, or something else, uh, it really just wasn't uh, the right thing to do anymore. I and mean, that's one of the major uh, learnings. And people, uh, people, the the patients themselves get it now in the context of you know, how what they do could spread. And, and, and so how do we go about mitigating that uh, as, we, as we move forward? So telehealth is not just a COVID fad, uh, it is uh, something that's gonna be embraced across the delivery of care uh, for, for a long time to come. So when we look at the, uh, you know, how, how we move past COVID and what we might be seeing is, you know, even in hospital settings, it's not just about patients going into the waiting room and mitigating uh, and, and social distancing and, and things of that nature. It's about how can doctors engage patients uh, at, the, at the bedside? 
maybe they're not necessarily at the bedside a hundred percent of the time. Maybe the uh, maybe the doctor comes to them through a, a video encounter and and be and, and allowing maybe greater efficiency of the provider, but yet still providing that same quality of care. Uh, and then then it's the um, you know how do we so with that you know what what has also happened during COVID is a lot of patients um, really just haven't engaged uh, healthcare and so they put off what doesn't hurt them but you know whether it be uh, you know screenings and uh, management of chronic conditions and things of that nature so it was too hard to do or decided not to do because they didn't want to take the risk of uh, of going someplace to uh, to have that potential exposure. So we'll, we will see uh, as we re-engage life here uh, in, in, as it was before COVID, you know, an onset of uh, uh, health systems condi uh, handling conditions that, uh, that weren't handled because uh, COVID was such the, uh, the attention uh, grabber, uh, certainly uh, correctly so, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there's a lot of domino effects relative to uh, uh, the the, uh, the delay of engagement and management of uh, of conditions. So, with that, uh, you know, when we look at pre-COVID and even post-COVID, mm -hmm. we see a, a, a significant uh, challenge relative to just number of uh, physicians uh, being available to provide uh, uh, care. And not only is it the number of physicians, you know, the, the larger macro trends here is that, uh, again, before COVID, things that we were trying to deal with is that we had a, a growing population. We had an aging population. We had a population contracting more and more chronic conditions. And they were still challenged with having less doctors and nurses available to deliver care. Those two things don't sink. And that's the reason why you know, when we uh, ultimately do need to reimagine care, because if you have a larger population, a sicker population, uh, and, and an aging population, and, and with less doctors and nurses, how do you deliver the same quality of care? Sometimes it's not always about going to the doctor, it's about being seen by the doctor and having that same level of quality encounter uh, that, uh, that you once had if you were going to that brick and mortar facility. So it, it, with that, it's not even about uh, a video uh, encounter. So uh, uh, let me just uh, go through a couple of things in that, again, when COVID hit, the immediate response was to do something, rightfully so, get something in place so I can engage my patients and some patients can engage me relative to... Um, uh, that delivery of care. And normally that has been just a, a video, a video only type of uh, engagement. And that's, and that was the right thing to do. But now, because once we've moved from telehealth being a nice to have to a must have, and now we're experiencing the value of telehealth and, and, and ultimately re-engaging in, well, how do we deal with the challenges that we were trying to deal with before COVID, it's a, mat, it's a matter of, you know, uh, COVID did for uh, the delivery, you know, what COVID did in eight months relative to the impact to, to, uh, to the nation, it, it advanced healthcare eight to 10 years because now, it, 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 because it fast forwarded the idea of the value of what telehealth can bring to the table. And it's not just about a video encounter. It's if we merge the two, uh, a, a, a older aging sicker population with less doctors and population health and, and, and leveraging, geez, how can we, um, and all the learnings of COVID, how can we reimagine the delivery of care? I'm not saying uh, for clarity, telehealth is, uh, is, is going to be a hundred, the tool used for hundred percent of engagement. I'm not, it has its right place, uh, but it's the, it's the merger of the two that really, um, uh, uh, really, again, allow us to reimagine the, the delivery of care. So I'll, I'll go through a couple constructs what, what, as to what I mean by it's not just about video 
and then uh, we'll engage uh, Brett in a, uh, in a conversation on those points. So, uh, so it's really, you know, when we look at the health system, the, the, the people, the patients are really at that center of that health system. Tom, before you move on. I um, might have a timer on it. I uh, apologize for that. Tom. Uh, so uh, the people at the, are at the uh, center of that health system, but the health system, when you look at that patient, their origins come from many different places or the setting of care is, is, is more than just the, the, uh, the acute setting. So when you look at the home, the ambulatory settings, even EMS, um, long-term care, corrections, schools, employers, these are all folks that all need some, uh, some constructs of care. And that health system really becomes that hub of the community. And so when we look at telehealth, it's really about how does one platform service all those different constituents uh, and be able to be dynamically um, uh, configured, if you will, to address the unique workflows and uh, and engagement models. And you know, if you're wondering why there's uh, these different points, uh, it's it's not only about a telehealth platform that is servicing one health system, one facility at one location. It's really about for you know, as an I, whether you're an IDN or you know, I live in Florida, so whether you're the state of Florida and you're looking to provide uh, services uh, across your state. You know, it's really one platform that services multiple facilities in a very unique way. Every facility might have uh, a different way of doing things. And how do we, how do we ultimately manage that through, um, uh, through, the, uh, through a telehealth platform? Tom, can you hear me? I can. I just want to launch that first poll we had for uh, what phase of healthcare system awesome. the attendees are in. So I just, uh, if you could please answer the question, what phase of healthcare, uh, what, sir, what phase of your health, what phase is your healthcare system in? Sorry, there's a typo there. Respond, recover, or re reimagine. Give it a few minutes for attendees to populate their answers. Do, 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 do. Hmm. Could play music. <laughs> A little background music. All right, we got about half the attendees so far have voted. So just uh, give it a few more minutes. So far, you, and, um, and I think the uh, the results are up. I think everybody can see it, but maybe not. Um, so I'll wait to the end. But right now, it's, it looks like respond is where about fifty three percent are currently. Uh, Reimagine is right behind that at thirty nine percent. All right, I'll go ahead and post the awesome. share the results so you can see. Everybody should be able to see. Uh, respond came about 53%, recover 9%, and reimagine 38%. So that's good. That's very good. Awesome. Okay. So uh, continuing on. Um, so we look, when we look at uh, telehealth, we look at uh, a telehealth platform, we look at um, certain pillars that are uh, necessary for. Um, for success. And, you know, again, when I said it's not just about a video encounter, it's really about a telehealth uh, platform that can service the health system across multiple use cases and being able to integrate with that EHR. And, and so not only that, the ability, again, not just to have a video encounter, but how do you handle the different types of engagements and async engagement? I'll go through that in a second. Uh, versus a synchronous engagement. And ultimately, if it was important to manage or to, if it was important to take vitals while you were in that brick and mortar facility to have a quality engagement, it's equally important to have to capture those vitals when, when, uh, and when in a virtual setting. Not that, again, you need to capture vitals for all uh, engagement models, but it is critical relative to um, uh, telehealth uh, moving beyond a video world to a full uh, quality uh, high acuity encounter. 
So uh, seamless medical device integration is, uh, is, a, is, is a critical key to all that. And as you can see, in, actually in this image, there's several different uh, medical devices, whether they're used in an acute care setting, an ambulatory setting, or the home, uh, the, the device necessary for that type of uh, care delivery is, uh, is important. So being able to dynamically interchange the devices in the context of a visit or in the context of the delivery of care model for that unique patient is, uh, is very critical. So as that home becomes the setting of care, so does the mindset of, well, all right, well, what, what type of devices do I need potentially in that home to, uh, to maximize the engagement, maximize the quality of care and allow that patient to ultimately even do, construct uh, some self-monitoring uh, efforts as they move along their, that continuum from awareness of their condition to wellness of their condition. So the uh, so how do you do that, right? Each patient, uh, each each uh, uh, engagement, uh, you know, that digital front door. How do I uh, how do how do I access um, how do I access the uh, the health system? Uh, and, and how do I handle a school-based encounter versus a corrections encounter versus an EMS encounter uh, and, and so forth and so on. You know, having a, uh, a, a protocol designer uh, that you can actually uh, use, you don't need us or anyone else to actually create these protocols. Uh, your health system can create these protocols uh, and very easily adapt them to that unique um, uh, use case. So this is what allows, as I was saying earlier, one platform to be able to be adaptive to the different use cases that you might have across your settings of care. Uh, these are things that you manage, not, not your telehealth uh, vendors, um, if you will. We're a tool, uh, not the, uh, uh, we're a tool that helps you uh, maximize your, uh, your, your ability to engage uh, your, your patients through one platform across multiple settings. Tom, we have another, um, we have a poll question about unified engagement. I just launched the poll question. How important is seamless medical device integration to your organization's telehealth strategy? So go ahead and uh, attendees can enter in their response. We'll wait a few minutes for that. It's still going, but so, so far very important is 77%. And just let it go a few more minutes. Okay, and I'll share the results. So 76% is very important, 20% somewhat important. And I think it's clear medical device integration is, is very important. Awesome. Okay, uh, I believe I have uh, one more slide uh, to go through and then uh, uh, we'll get into uh, a one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with Brett and he can share with us his, uh, his, his insights. So, you know, we look at this, um, we look at this uh, scenario, you know, uh, I talked about async engagements. Um, sorry about that. We look at this uh, async engagements um, and um, we look at, I'm gonna fight with my slide here. I'm sorry. So ultimately, about uh, it's about uh, async engagement to video engagement, and then uh, and then from uh, along that async uh, 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 vertical, there's a number of things you could do versus what you can do in a video engagement. And so what I'm trying to say here is that there's really no device integration taking place here, and and the patient is really engaging in an in a in an um, uh, offline manner all the way through having a video engagement. So let me give you some examples there. So I could go to the digital front door of the health system. 
I could uh, uh, you know, register for uh, an urgent, a quote unquote, urgent complaint. I can list out what that complaint is. It goes into a queue and, um, and, the, and, the, and the provider may look at that complaint and say, yeah, I get it. Um, you know, I just, I just sent uh, a prescription over uh, to, uh, to your local pharmacy and, um, you know, and, and here's the information. Or the provider can say, hey, I get it. Let's schedule a video encounter. Let me, let me talk to you about a couple of things and then have that video encounter, right? That's a low acuity encounter. No devices required. But then you have, you know, we hear a lot about remote patient monitoring. I, I might rephrase that and say it's a really a monitoring service. Depending on the device that uh, could be prescribed to a patient, they could perform self-assessments, uh, and that data flows uh, to uh, to that health system, whether it be a, a, an ambulatory EHR or a uh, or an acute care uh, EHR. That data flows uh, to the e, uh, to that health system, so there's still one um, one uh, longitudinal view of that patient. Uh, it, but it's not necessary for that data to flow, but it, uh, if, if, if they don't want it to, but the, minimally the patient can take that device and you know, measure their blood pressure, measure their vitals, uh, other, other vitals, and, and be able to record that and, and share that with the health system uh, 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 at the appropriate uh, point. And then uh, you, know, you had the, I'll just use the visiting nurse service as a different example. There's still a monitoring service. There's no one. There's no physician involved, but you know, a nurse is coming in uh, to the home to take vitals and to to assess the the, the current state of that that patient's uh, 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 state in uh, relative to uh, the, you know, the whatever condition that they might be managing. But then you could also move into if there's a need for escalation in a monitoring stage. It's there. You could uh, escalate that into an urgent high acuity encounter where the provider is actually engaged. So here you have the patient with a medical device that moves into a video engagement, and that device. So yeah, you did capture vitals uh, prior to the video engagement, but the doctor might say, "Hey, let me see those. Uh, let me see those vitals again." And in real time, that data streams from that device to the to the provider. And whether that device is capturing data per se, whether it's uh, a stethoscope and that data is flowing directly to the uh, to the provider's ears across the internet, or whether it's capturing images, it's an otoscope. You took a picture of your ear, the nose, the throat, um, uh, in a in a in a directed way from the provider, and that all that information is captured in real time and being able to seen by the provider, and then that is you know what we would refer to as a, a high acuity encounter. And, a, and, a, and, a, um, and the same thing holds true if you have a nurse in that home or at that setting of care uh, where they're escalating, the same thing holds true. Uh, the difference here is that obviously the patient isn't doing the assessment, the doctor is instructing the nurse or the practitioner to, to engage and, uh, and move accordingly. So that's, the, that's really, this is really the only commercial that you get from me from, a, from an AMD perspective in that, you know, that's really the, the difference between a video only uh, scenario that you might have adopted in the context of respond uh, versus reimagining um, versus reimagining the um, the uh, the current state of uh, care. So, a, a telehealth platform that can address all of that is really what allows you to maximize a single platform across your, your health system that ad uniquely addresses the different needs of, of your patient base, coupled with obviously um, a, a device portfolio that can help you uh, achieve that. Um, so it's a video and devices coupled with the flow of data that ultimately um, drives how telehealth, virtual care deli delivery more importantly, uh, will be used um, in the months and years ahead. Hey, we have one more poll question, Tom. I just, I just um, <clears throat> launched it. What services are most important to your organization's business goals and virtual care strategy? So low acuity encounters, monitoring services, high acuity encounters, or all of the above? I'll give it a few minutes again.
interestingly enough so far, and I'll launch it when it's done, but 72% uh, are saying all of the above, which is great. That means it's they're looking to scale. Yeah, and that and that's uh, that really tells me you know, that that's really the proper use of telehealth. And there's a lot of different uses. Uh, again, it's the ability for a telehealth platform to scale. You know, I, I ultimately related to uh, patient portals to some degree, believe it or not. You know, uh, multiple EHRs within the health system means multiple potentially multiple patient portals. You really can't ask the patient to go to multiple patient portals to access their their uh, their health records. So the same thing holds true with um, uh, telehealth in that having multiple telehealth platforms within one health system creates usability challenges and, and um, engagement challenges of, you know, this condition, that uh, this model of care, this telehealth platform. And, and you know, th I use this device, that means I have to use this telehealth platform. And it just becomes very uh, costly and, um, and doesn't, in my view, doesn't do much in context of maximizing that patient's um, uh, engagement. The results, I uh, shared them here. So again, it's 74% it's are saying all of the above. And then 17% are just saying low acuity, 5% monitoring services, and 5% high acuity. Awesome. So with that, we, uh, we can move into our one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, let me just uh, advance the slides here. So Rhett, I appreciate your, uh, your spending the, uh, the time to uh, join us in this conversation. I um, thought uh, we might just uh, kick it off by, you know, your, your uh, Oklahoma State uh, University of Medicine is in the trenches uh, relative to COVID. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about uh, your perspective of uh, where you're at, what your system's doing, and some of the learnings you have. Uh, yes, thank you, Tom. Happy to do so. Good, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so, you know, it's been interesting just hearing some of the observations that you've offered this morning and in anticipation of spending some time with the group. You know, I think it is important that, you know, as much as we can, um, you know, that we maintain an amount of reflection uh, as the advancement of telemedicine is still moving at an incredible pace across many markets, um, you know, across the country. And, you know, I'm happy to share a little bit about our experience in Oklahoma with, with OSU. So uh, just for benefit of the group, OSU Medicine's an academic integrated healthcare delivery network, primarily focused in um, Northeast Oklahoma. We have uh, our, uh, our academic health center uh, teaching hospital is located downtown Tulsa. And then we have a network of roughly 600 adjunct and clinical faculty spread across the state. And telemedicine for us has always been, you know, Tom, I think you mentioned it as a nice to have. Many, many systems treated it as such. Uh, it was a nice to have. It was something that uh, was, you know, really viewed as either uh, a convenience or complementary to something else that was more, uh, that was treated more of a, more like a core competency. And uh, there were, uh, you know, for us, a variety of reasons for that. Um, but ultimately, what it what it what it meant for us is that there was this inconsistent amount of urgency around solidifying uh, telemedicine as a as a core competency or as a key um, uh, as a key modality in the way that we organize care across our communities and. Um, and so we kind of brought that history, that mindset uh, into 2020. Um, it was kind of, you know, the beginning of 2020 was business as usual. And then of course, everything changed in March and April. And that set the course for us. Um, that set us down a course of really, you know, forever changing uh, the, the way that we have uh, organized, orchestrated and established our healthcare delivery system. Interesting. And, and, and how do you see the meshing, if you will, of the classic care delivery model with a, 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 the insurgents and the integration of a, a virtual care delivery model? 
Yeah, I think that's a, a great question. We're still, um, you know, we're, we're, we're collecting evidence on that based, based on our experience and, and there, um, there's still some variety. There's some variation. So, yeah. um, you know, in, in, in our experience in Oklahoma, what we had the opportunity to do through uh, our relationship with the state and our uh, commitment and experience in uh, rural markets across the state, we, we were asked to scale a hospitalist program uh, immediately um, from the standpoint of technology procurement and acquisition, getting it to each of the markets and then having the clinical bandwidth and expertise to provide a hospitalist service um, in the middle of a pandemic um, and all the adrenaline and uncertainty and, um, uh, and, and to some degree excitement that, uh, that, that all of those activities brought with it. And our experience thus far has, has you know, portions of it have been really consistent with um, some of the uh, market-based research that, that you've presented. Um, I think a couple of things that I would you know, kind of highlight are many of the rural markets that we were routinely engaged with um, were also routinely reluctant to embrace telemedicine. Um, some of that because of you know, lack of physician understanding, um, commitment, um, or maybe just a, you know, a, a cultural uh, characteristic of the medical staff in that community. Uh, was that they just hadn't given telemedicine enough of a, a, of a look, uh, a credible look to be taken seriously. And then there's certainly ripple effects that, that creates in the community. Certain communities, um, there wasn't enough interest from the uh, patients being served in those communities. So there was a, you know, kind of a tie-in because of the lack of physician um, support for the service uh, that, that, that served as a little bit of a roadblock for patients to immediately embrace interest in the service, um, and, uh, and and so that also comes with its own, you know, kind of delays and and uh, uh, and repercussions uh, as it relates to how you approach a community um, with the idea of of legitimizing telemedicine, um, describing its features and benefits, and helping them understand that not only can their outcomes be protected, their health outcomes but they can also be enhanced uh, and really clarifying how we, how, how we articulate that, um, the evidence behind it, and, uh, and what does that mean to their specific experience with, with telemedicine. And so as COVID came, it, it took all that away. It wasn't, well, we get time to kind of decide and, 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 and discern through, do we wanna do this or do we not? It was, we have to do this, um, the, 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 the time for adoption has already passed and we've got to, you know, we, we've got to move quickly into this in order to uh, continue to create accessibility, um, to continue to honor and protect the physician patient relationship uh, and to do everything we can to minimize as much as possible any disruption in care, particularly for those um, who have very com uh, compromised uh, immune systems or comorbid conditions, chronic conditions, et cetera, because of the transmissibility of COVID and because of um, the impact that it's had on populations across our country, but particularly those populations that are already, uh, they have their uh, a, a, a compromised health status, uh, the, the accessibility to physician expertise and, and care was, was, was really important. So, um, Fortunately, in, 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 in one instance or in one regard, this has helped uh, accelerate the, uh, the adoption and long-term uh, commitment to, uh, uh, to telemedicine and really helped embed in many rural areas across the Oklahoma community and geography. Um, it, it's really helped solidify telemedicine so much so that physicians now have made comments to us that, well, this is really the only way that I'm gonna be practicing medicine. Uh, or I'm, I'm only going to do this in a majority capacity for my practice now. I'll never not do telemedicine. And patients have said the same thing. We didn't know how convenient it was going to be. Um, it, uh, it, 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 in many cases, um, was described to us that the, um, the skepticism that they had was uh, easily overcome by the safety that they felt. 
by having the encounter and not um, being in a healthcare setting with other patients who may have other ailments, COVID related or otherwise, um, that, that would increase their anxiety or concern around uh, their own uh, health care needs. Yeah. From, from what you're saying, it, it sounds as if telehealth has um, uh, increased the confidence or, uh, or maybe the, um, that's probably, it sounds, uh, well, probably more so increased access to care, right? You, you, you have a unique situation, uh, uh, much like uh, some other uh, health systems, you're in a rural setting. So uh, sometimes that mobility of traveling an hour into town, if you will, to get access to care it was always a challenge. So it was easy to defer it. Uh, where now telehealth is, you know, I could, I could do it, I, frankly, on a, on, a, you know, on a moment's notice, if you will, relative to an urgent care encounter. You think that telehealth has actually imp improved access to care in that context for the rural community? We, we definitely do. We, we have a thousand um, uh, rural Medicaid beneficiaries that we provide um, health care services for in a variety of ways. And uh, it's a kind of a defined membership model, captive environment. And um, a majority of the encounters that we have with them are either face to face or telephonic. And what, what we for that population in particular, routine engagement is, is really incredibly important because of all of the factors and, and, and a few more that, that you mentioned around obstacles to care, whether that be accessibility, whether it be transportation um, or, uh, or a host of others. Um, having the ability to usher in um, an intimate healthcare delivery exper experience uh, that was very similar to them in terms of patient, uh, a patient to patient traditional uh, setting, but just doing it through digital means. I think that uh, the feedback that we received is that they were pleasantly surprised at how warm the interaction felt um, and, um, and how, how much confidence they came away with as a result of that interaction in continuing to receive care through that medium. So uh, it sounds as though uh, you know your your adoption uh, of uh, telehealth is is currently in that what I would refer to as that respond phase, right? Uh, do, or, or, I could be wrong there, but uh, you tell me. But uh, how do you see that home transitioning to a, I won't say a more permanent setting of care, but a more utilized setting of care? Uh, using uh, medical devices uh, to support that encounter? I think that's a great question. I think there's an urban and, and rural component to that. I think that uh, um, they each present with their own um, opportunities and their own challenges, uh, to be quite honest. Um, some of it is just technology itself. Um, systems that tend to be more urban focused uh, and have a larger ar array of, of resource bases can get those types of uh, technological devices and, and uh, resources out into the hands of their community or their patients, rural, uh, their rural counterparts, um, as a comparison, uh, on occasion struggle uh, to do so with as much, you know, regularity, frequency, um, and in a way that continues to kind of keep up with um, the advances. And, you know, certainly the reason for that is because of cost and, and uh, um, and access to revenue or um, the ability to just uh, acquire the technology in total. So, you know, there is, there, is there, there are two separate lanes to that. Both of them are equally important. Patients in um, service areas that define urban versus rural um, certainly are uh, equally deserving. Um, and I think the challenge for us is just making sure that um, we're, um, not prioritizing one front over the other and, you know, and, and thinking about our obligations, for example, to the state, we have, um, you know, we, we, we provide a lot of, of, of urban care in the Tulsa metro area and then uh, equally important and, and almost in equal amounts, provide a lot of rural care to um, counties uh, across the state. And so it, 
in in my opinion, Tom, that question as you you know relates to more specific kinds of technology devices. That really is an accessibility issue that is uh, cost driven up front and and not uh, the challenge. I, I would say is not immediate um, in in terms of. Uh, clinical availability and access to physician expertise. It's really around resources to get those technology devices in the hands of people that can benefit from them the most. Yeah, I, I, uh, I often say that the discussion has quickly turned from who's going to pay for telehealth to who's going to pay for that device um, in, in the context of, uh, you know, again, that reimagining uh, phase. So, uh, Red. Uh, Take me on a take me on a journey. The uh, attendees on a journey. You know, we, we've learned a lot, and there's still a lot to learn relative to uh, where we're going in the adoption of uh, telehealth. But go three years down the road from now. Uh, how do you see the delivery of care model uh, changing, uh, given what we've learned and 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 our application of telehealth? You, you bet. I'll, I'll give you a couple comments. That's a heck of a question. Um, I, I will give you a few comments just on things that I would uh, describe as, you know, kind of ideal. The, um, you know, the, the idea that we get there not remains to be seen, but, you know, uh, there's so much opportunity in the advancement of technology. There's so much innovation in the advancement of, of data. And if you think about the role that telemedicine plays in the future of how um, care is organized um, across our industry, um, in a variety of different settings. I think that telemedicine now gives us the, um, the ability to do a couple things. One, meet patients where they are and provide care for them in ways that were yesterday, last month, last week, um, you know, maybe not completely conceivable. And I think that the, the, the adoption uh, will continue to be rapid. I think the advancement around technology and innovation will continue to be rapid. And I think that consumers who historically have been hesitant uh, will now become uh, vocal advocates um, and insistent upon um, digital um, health and uh, and and features um, of, of care uh, modalities um, of, of care that uh, uh, that incorporate their interests to um, to receive care in a digital capacity. I think that we'll make clinical advancements. I think that the data that we're gathering around outcomes are, that are being provided as a result of uh, digital clinical integration is gonna be um, uh, incredibly important. I think the reimbursement journey is going to improve, perhaps not to the degree that many would like, uh, but I do think it will continue to improve. Um, so I think there's a there's an outcomes, there's a clinical outcomes piece to this, there's an economic piece to this, and then there's a community benefit in terms of total health and population health of, of communities that, uh, uh, that, that telehealth and telemedicine will, will do as much to advance as anything um, else that we have in the industry today. So um, I just think there's a tremendous amount of excitement, enthusiasm for, for this space, and it's going to uh, it's going to be a critical part of our journey forward in, um, uh, in the way that communities receive care. Awesome. I couldn't agree more. Uh, great thoughts there. Uh, Carrie, would, do we want to open it up um, for Q&A? Sure. I will let, um, I, we do have one question or a couple of questions. Let's see. One question so far I can, I can start with, but just for all attendees, if in case you do have questions for Tom or Rhett there, again, just click on the Q and A button in the bottom and, and go ahead and start entering your questions. Uh, Tom, I'll start with the first one here. Um, integrated patient management systems are beginning to be introduced within our healthcare system. Is it important for hospitals to share identical systems when patients are treated across multiple sites? Is it important for hospitals to share the same system across multiple sites? I might take uh, telehealth out of that equation for a second uh, in, in context of the EHR, uh, multiple EHRs within a health system or within uh, within a community, uh, take the health system out of it. I, I think the average health system actually has multiple, uh, uh, even though you know they might have one uh, one major one. Uh, so I'm not quite sure technology should play a role in context of 
um, uh, how that patient traverses the community of care. However, uh, having one, a single platform certainly creates predictability on how that patient engages. Uh, I go back to my patient portal model, right? How one patient portal works and the features of a one patient portal versus another, totally different. Um, but, uh, and the same thing should hold true for telehealth. The, it should, you know, there is advantages to having one platform uh, that a health system would use across multiple facilities, thinking that the health system also had one um, data platform, population health platform across uh, multiple facilities uh, to advance the, uh, the delivery of care. I don't know if that answered your question, Brett, any insights on, on that from your perspective? Yeah, I would just uh, briefly add that it's a big, for me, it's, it is a big uh, emphatic and enthusiastic yes. And here's, and, and, and my passion for that is, is as follows. We, we have as an industry designed digital neighborhoods that are very territorial. And you may um, be a patient in a system in a rural community and uh, you've received telemedicine um, uh, through, um, you know, I'll, I'll just use Mercy as an example in, in Oklahoma. Mercy's got a large presence in Oklahoma, both urban and rural, and um, their telemedicine and telehealth environment is, is very exclusive to um, their box, if you will, their sandbox. And there may be um, specialists in other areas that are close by uh, that could benefit from uh, providing patient care in a, in a rural area that uh, are not either employed or affiliated with a larger system. And because of that, they're not able to participate in that patient's care from the standpoint of being excluded out of the telemedicine digital network. And, and I, I think that we've got to get away from that. W one of the things that we did in designing our response activities for rural markets that we're serving is our, our platform is agnostic. So we, we want to serve the needs of the community, but we don't want to serve the needs of the community based on only the things that we can do. We recognize that there are specialists that may have other uh, arrangements or affiliations with other systems outside of OSU, and we're not going to allow that to be a careless barrier uh, to, to, to patients' ability to access care in, in their communities. We've got to do better and, and do more, I think, as an industry uh, to make that more inviting. And, you know, does that sound Pollyannic and kind of pie in the sky to some? Perhaps, but I'm, 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 I am not confused at all uh, about uh, the importance of that. And, uh, and that's really enhanced by, again, my view that, uh, that th those are careless territory boundaries uh, that prevent patients from being served um, and prevent their uh, greatest good from being pursued as it relates to uh, healthcare services that are, that are made avail available in, um, uh, in rural areas where they're so difficult to uh, access uh, uh, already, so. Okay, thank you, Tom and Wright. All right, we have a couple more here. Let's see. What clinical diagnostic tools are on the horizon to integrate with telemedicine carts, similar to handheld cameras, stethoscopes, EKGs, et cetera, for specifically for a clinical evaluation during a telemedicine encounter? Uh, there's, uh, uh, I'll take that one first, Brett, if you don't mind. Brett, uh, it, it, there's a, a number of different types of devices um, that are more, uh, that, that, that apply more, a greater degree of simplicity uh, for a consumer to use. Uh, and I think that those, uh, those types of technologies are going to be, uh, uh, you're, we'll see an acceleration of those, uh, those types of technologies uh, as, uh, as uh, health systems start to look at, well, how do we uh, uh, create uh, or maximize the use of that home as a setting of care, uh, and how do we? And, and it's not just about having the one-off encounter. It's it's really for those that have multiple chronic conditions or conditions to mitigate reimbursements or re readmittance and and or 
uh, life-threatening uh, illnesses that, uh, that need monitoring that can be done more so in the house. So I think that there is a plethora of uh, innovation taking place in the device, the medical device uh, arena uh, that uh, will be applicable as we move forward. Hey, great. Um... All right, this is a really good question. Uh, Rhett, uh, I just want to make sure, any any additional insights there? No, nothing further. I totally agree with, uh, uh, I totally agree with your comments on that. Okay, another actually a question around uh, devices and of course the, the adoption of, of using devices in telehealth. It says, how do you anticipate handling the megadata generated by global adoption of telehealth devices? Data is power, um, and in order to maximize the, um, I always say that. Uh, let me back up. You know, uh, I always use the scenario of the uh, the average Medicare patient. An average Medicare patient that has five chronic conditions sees nine different doctors in a given year, and they spend about fifteen hours in front of that doctor by stats. The question is, what happens the other seven eight thousand seven hundred and forty five hours? relative to the continuum of care. What happens in that time slot is critical. And, and, if it's, and if they do have multiple chronic conditions, instead of allowing things to fester, if you will, that data, that self-assessment data can flow. And I do think that there will be, uh, so there's gonna be a plethora of data that flows. The question is, how do we handle that data I, I don't have any illusions that it's going to be impossible for a person to ultimately be the data miner of that data and to be able to, to, be able to quickly respond to that. There is a layer of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, that can be pursued uh, that it does that interrogation of the data and provides some level of advisory of, hey, you know, that blood pressure you know, you're on an upward trend, I'd be calling the doctor if I were you hypothetically, right? Or so that there's, there's, there's not that uh, alert fatigue that takes place uh, that we all talk about. There is a level of a technology and innovation that serves as that middle layer that maximizes that patient's uh, understanding actually of what that data was, right? I just took, um, you know, I just uh, I had pulse ox, my oxygen levels at 90, right? That's a problem. Uh, you should go to the doctor. Uh, so it's, it's one thing to collect the data and the patient to understand the data so that they, they can react. So there's that side of the equation, education on the consumer side. And then there's the, how does the health system adopt uh, AI and population health management tools that help them sift through that data and prioritize where, um, where um, activity needs to be uh, applied to maximize that care. Rhett, anything on your side? Yeah, I just think at a very, very high level, it's this the combination of the relationship between, you know, the various EMRs and really, you know, we're talking about, you know, some of the, for purposes, I think perhaps for purposes of the conversation, you're talking about Epic Cerner and, and the like, and then you've got, you know, health information exchanges set up across uh, communities across and regions across the country the interoperability between those environments in particular is not as clean as it needs to be, should be. And I think, you know, there, we'll, we'll also see some progress in that regard. I think that and a few other things uh, combined really feed into the art, artificial intelligence, uh, the data aggregation and the interrogation that you described uh, to help um, advance the efficacy of clinical decision-making where it is most needed. Um, not to remove, um, not to remove decision-making um, authority from the physician, uh, but just to further um, further enhance uh, the integrity and the efficacy of treatment protocols on a you know disease by disease basis. Okay. Good points. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So uh, another question here: Do you see video patient? education content, enhancing the patient engagement and the patient experience? And if so, do you see the content helping the provider be more efficient? I think patient education in and of itself 
helps the provider be more efficient. Uh, I always talk about the, the awareness uh, to wellness continuum. And the awareness is really about education, whether that education comes in the form of text that one needs to read or videos that one needs to watch. Uh, you know, if you're recently diagnosed with diabetes, um, maybe there's a lot to learn about diabetes, not only the, 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 the disease in and of itself, but how do you need to change your dietary uh, behaviors and, and things of that nature? And what are the repercussions of, of that? So education in and of itself uh, being integrated into, um, into the, um, uh, in, in, into the, uh, into the flow, uh, the engagement flow is, is critical. So I, I, I you know, sometimes uh, it's important not to prescribe the pill, if you will, but to prescribe information uh, that gets that patient uh, better engaged with, um, with, with care. It's it, it, when a doctor is, uh, identifies a care, a care plan, uh, the greatest challenge really is around changing the behavior of the patient. And that only comes be, uh, when they're better educated in, in the condition that they have and what they need to do versus uh, what the doctor needs to do for them. Again, in that 8,745 hours, th that's where the education takes place. That's where the behavioral change uh, takes place. And then they go for this uh, event uh, of an encounter with a provider that says you're on the, you're on the right track, you're on the wrong track uh, type of scenario, or let's change course here. Um, but yeah, education is uh, key. Red, anything on your side? Uh, no, I agree totally with you. I think it's the the balance of it is just kind of information overload and packaging content that is easily digestible and um, and translatable and and. Uh, uh, and, and not intimidating to, to receive uh, for patients. Yeah, I might add uh, that, you know, it, it, it's not only uh, incumbent upon the provider to do the quote unquote prescribing of the, of the educational content, but having platforms available where, and, and I'm not talking about the internet, frankly, but, uh, I, but having uh, platforms available where a patient can go and do a search on, on uh, uh, credible uh, content and so that, that they do want to learn, they have a place to go and, uh, and learn without, uh, you know, giving them a, a 25 page document to read upon uh, uh, discharge and thinking that uh, they're going to read that whole document and, um, and not be seen again within the next 30 days. I, um, we actually were just coming up on the hour and I know Rhett had a hard stop at noon. So I think we just lost him. I would, didn't want to interrupt you, but um, there were a few more questions, Tom. I don't know if you want to address these at the end. They're just, uh, they're pretty quick questions or. Sure. Um, so what is, uh, how do we leverage artificial intelligence? And actually that's not a quick question, but how do we leverage artificial intelligence to, to improve telehealth clinical encounters? So there's a couple different ways. So, you know, as that data flows, there's a, there's a receptor, if you will, in the AI world that I would speak of that, that says, hey, uh, I got this data. I'm comparing it against the trends of this particular patient. And, you know, if you look at um, Alexa as, a, as an example of having someone that can actually speak to the, uh, to the patient that says, hey, as I said before, you know, I, I just took your blood pressure. I just took your uh, pulse, your heart rate, your uh, oxidization level. You know, the, uh, you're good, if you will, uh, as opposed to, because I always relate things to my 82-year-old mother who had cancer. And, uh, you know, she might not know what all those uh, uh, vital numbers uh, mean. So AI is, is another form of education, frankly, bringing education to the patient and giving them some level of comfort and satisfaction. And, uh, and it's also a way of uh, further escalating. Uh, so there's, you know, I look at AI as that, you know, how do we, how do we maximize the clinical uh, decision-making uh, process, both again, on the consumer side, as well as the, uh, the provider side of the, the equation. Uh, and again, I, I might reflect back in life and when my uh, father was in a rehab, and I don't mean to keep talking about my, my family history, but you know, I can remember years ago, you know, a big two-inch textbook or a folder that uh, 
uh, binder actually that he's flipping through these pages. And I'm like, there's no way he's reading all that stuff. But if you had an AI tool that was able to mine that data, uh, it could uh, it could uh, be uh, provide that greater granularity and, and specificity towards um, what is it that uh, we should be doing here. It uh, looks like we do have some more questions. Um, I don't know. I, I think at this point, there's only one or two left. Um, one was just, and then we can end it. I think I'm going to be conscious of everybody's time. I know uh, people have been on for almost an hour now. So uh, the last question here is, how important is it to teach telehealth skills to clinicians to enhance the efficacy of telehealth? Well, it's, it's very important. Uh, and the use of any tool, whether uh, any adoption of technology uh, is, um, is the education of that um, is, is critical. So, you know, when we saw earlier in the slides that 57% of providers uh, like telehealth and, and want to use it moving forward, the question is, uh, what happens out of the 43? Is there more education? Does it need to, do we need to implement simplicity uh, and, and things of that nature? So uh, it, it's a key part of any deployment. Um, you can't throw technology at, at, at the doctors at, at, and anybody in the, uh, the delivery of care ecosystem. The training is, uh, is paramount relative to adoption for both the provider side and the patient side. Okay. Um, so that concludes our webinar. I uh, just want to reiterate that if uh, you register for the webinar, then we, you will receive a recording that you can, of course, watch or share with your colleagues, as well as a copy of the slides. You'll receive that email by tomorrow. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel please feel free to reach out to myself or Tom. Uh, we'll include our contact information in the follow-up email. And thank you for attending. And thank you, Tom, for your insights. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending. Appreciate it.